Good afternoon. Welcome to CornCon 6. Wow, it's 2020, and I was told today that it's October already. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Gene Spafford, pr professor at Purdue University. I've known Spaff for a long time. Um, he's, his talk has no title, uh, but it's going to be a great talk. We have a, we have a good audience here. And uh, we're recording this for posterity. It'll be up on our YouTube here in the next day or two. Um, let's see. I think that's about it, Spaff. I'll, I'll let you uh, take over here. All right. Well, hello, everyone. I'm going to try and share my screen and see how this works. So I've got a screen shared. Do you see my? I, I see the screen. I also see the previews on the left. All right. Well, that's not quite right. Do you have the right screen now? I, I do see it. It's a little bit small, but it, it's, it's very legible. OK. So uh, you don't have two slides up on the screen, just one? I just see one. Excellent. Well, we right. did have a, com a comment earlier. We had a speaker. The slides were a little bit small. And the answer was, if you go up to the top, there's a change screen. Is there an option for that? I'm looking. Left side, upper, above a timer, as I recall. Um, oh, well, I'm using Keynote, so. Okay. Power. Well, this is, I think this is fine. All right. I can see the slide. It's just a, a, only a little bit small. So go right ahead. Sorry. All right. Well, so hi, everyone. Um, this talk doesn't have a title, and that is the title. There's ambiguity there, and that's actually part of what I'm talking about, is ambiguity and the purpose of this talk. Um, so I'll just start off by saying this is also interspersed with a number of quotes that I find appropriate. And I think some of you may as well. Sometimes I wonder if I'm in my right mind and then it passes off and I'm as intelligent as ever. And that's basically what this is about. Um, what I wanna do is start off and say in computing, software engineering, which you've, un well, I won't say undoubtedly, but perhaps have heard about, is a building systems that do what you want them to do. Safety engineering is another area of computing, and that's building systems that don't do things you don't want them to do, like fail catastrophically. Security engineering is building systems that only do what you want them to do. That's the hardest of the three because you not only have to make them do what you want to do, but you wanna make sure they don't do things you don't want them to do. So it has to be correct and safe. Part of what we do in cybersecurity is try to think in ways that system designers have not anticipated, if we're not the system designers, that is, and try to apply some out of the box thinking to get some new insights into science and engineering both in how to build systems, and if our job is to look for flaws in them, find out how they're misconfigured, also to do that. And so uh, by trying to think outside the box, think in ways that the designers didn't intend, we may be able to find some flaws or misconfigurations. So what follows are some examples I use in classes, uh, some of my classes at the university, to illustrate some ways of thinking to help you sort of get in this mindset. And along with some lessons that may or may not be useful to you. Um, I would uh, say try to solve these. If you have some paper and pencils or pens or crayons, uh, an inkwell with a feather, whatever it may be, uh, you can try to solve some of these as we go along, otherwise try to work them out in your head. So when you get a solution, don't post it on, a ch on the chat, 
if you've got video, if you've got if you've got audio on yours, don't don't yell it out. Um, give others an opportunity to try to think through the solution, and I'll give the solution to these as we go along. I'm just not going to give you a very long time for each of them. Okay, so let's start with a diagram, and we're going to have four questions related to this diagram with this square, and it's actually seven squares, if you look at it in that way, where A, B, C, and D are each a square, and then each of the little black sections inside is also a square. So let's get that out of the way. They're actually squares. So I'm going to ask you four questions related to this, and let's see how you do. So the first question is, divide the white area in square A, that is the upper right quadrant, into two equal pieces. Now this should be pretty easy. You can do this in your head. You don't have to write this down. Dividing the white area into two equal pieces. Equal, equivalent, same. That's gonna be the meaning in each of the following problems. How do you do it? There's the answer. It's fairly straightforward. Each of those diagonals, each of those parts separated by the diagonal is a mirror image of the other one. Okay, let's move on to one that's a little harder. That's in B, divided into three equal pieces. This is a little bit more difficult. Still, it's not too difficult. And again, if you think about it for a moment, you should be able to get this visualized in your, in your mind, or if you scratch it out uh, very quickly on, on paper or canvas or the desk or somebody sitting next to you, you'll be able to come up with a solution. And there it is. Basically just extending two of the sides of that inner square. And now we have three squares in the white area in area B. Okay, so this gives you the idea. Now let's move to a harder one. Divide the area C into four equal pieces. This is difficult. This is not simple. I've had people get it. You can think about it. And what I'll do is I'll give you, I'll give you a little bit of time here to think about this and maybe sketch it out if you've got something that you can work on to get an idea of what it would look like. But remember, they have to be the same shape, same volume or uh, same area uh, in the solution by drawing lines there. So a couple of you may have the answer, but because this one's hard, I'm guessing that probably most of you don't. But when you see the solution, you'll go, oh yeah, that works. Each of those, if you look at it, same shape and same area. That was a little tough, but people who have a good understanding of geometry tend to get that. Okay, so now that you've loosened up on this, we're gonna ask the hardest one. Okay, we went two, three, four, and now we're gonna to jump to seven. Okay, this is really tough. Although people who have a really good understanding of geometry and unusual shapes may get this. So I'm gonna let you go for a couple seconds and think about how you would do that. It's tough, isn't it? Although I bet a few of you have gotten it. I mean, I don't know how many there are out there watching this, but there's probably a couple who thought about the answer. There you go. It's really not that difficult. But what's happened is that the way I primed you with the questions for the other three and their solutions, you probably weren't thinking along these lines. 
So if you didn't get the answer, don't feel badly about that. That's actually what very often happens when you get stuck in a rut thinking about things. If you get in a mode where you think the answer must look like a certain kind of solution, then you may not find the actual answer. So conditioning is one of the things that we have to overcome when we work in security. Let's do another one. Well, instead of geometry, we're going to move to something to see what your mastery is of English language. Okay, here's a line of letters. And what you need to do is cross out six letters so the remaining letters, without altering their sequence, will spell a familiar English word. So what I'm gonna do is I'll give you a whole minute to look through this and try to think of how you cross out six letters so the remaining letters will spell a familiar English word. Okay, got 30 more seconds. I wish I had some way of knowing how many of you actually solve this or not. I see there's 35 people watching. All right, we got 10 more seconds. There we go. Did you get the answer? You see there? Crossed out six letters. S-I-X-L-E-T-T-E-R-S. -T -T -E and you get the word banana. Here's another thing that's important when we're working in security or computing in general, and that's being alert to ambiguity where something may have multiple meanings. And I sort of like that quote by Sigmund Freud there, but ambiguity pops up all the time in language because words can have multiple meanings just as they did in that problem. And so when we are reading a manual or specifications or comments or user instructions or even code, we should be alert to the fact that there may be more than one meaning in whatever it is we're reading or watching. All right, so we're gonna go from uh, language to Roman numerals. Let's see how you do here. So the Roman numeral XI, and I'm assuming most people know what that means. XI is 11, that's 10 plus one. So, Add a single line to that to change it to 12. And that's pretty straightforward. You just add another one or another I is basically what that is. So that's how Roman numerals work. And I think most people can figure that out. So change XX to represent 19. And I usually find that Younger people who've been exposed to this in school um, more recently tend to get this pretty quickly. And you just put an I in between. So it's XIX and that's 19. So here's another one, change II to represent nine. So it's basically changing two to represent nine by adding a single line. Now on this, I'm limited somewhat by the display the way that I, that I showed this, but basically you put a line through the second one to turn it into an X. So you have I X and there's nine. If you got that, congratulate yourself. And then we'll do one last simple one to show how this works. Change I X to represent six. Single line. Again, this is one usually where younger members of the audience often get this before 
older members of the audience. And I'm sure you've gotten it by now. You draw that single line and there you have six. The lesson from this is don't assume context. So the fact that we were talking Roman numerals for the first three didn't mean that they were all Roman numerals. Because all I did is say, uh, add one line, and it could be a curved line, to get six. And that's what we did. Groucho Marx, one of uh, the great philosophers of all time, uh, has a quote for nearly everything, and particularly for this. So again, don't assume context, or don't let previous examples constrain your thinking for the current problem. Here's one you may have seen before, but not everybody has seen it or remembers it. We put nine dots down in a regular pattern, and the goal is for you to draw five straight lines without lifting your pencil or pen or crayon or whatever it is from the paper, so to go through each dot exactly once. Now, this is a little harder to do if you have to imagine it, and so if you don't have something to draw with in front of you, that's a little harder, uh, but try and imagine this. Um, how you might do that for five lines and nine dots. There's one, there's two. If you think about it, you might be able to come up with three more that will take you through all the dots. And there's actually several solutions. This one, there's a third line, fourth line, fifth line. So you can draw that all without taking your, your writing instrument up from your surface and you get five lines going through all nine dots. Okay. A harder one is do the same thing with four lines. And again, I'm gonna give you maybe 45 seconds here. If I was doing this in person, I'd have a better idea. I'd be able to see you with uh, I, uh, paper, pencil, other, kinds of things to see how many of you got the solution. But we'll go for about another 30 seconds and let you try this out if you've got some paper in front of you. Uh, it's the same kind of problem, it's just one fewer line, which would seem easier, but it's not. All right, so some of you may have the solution. One, two, three, four. See, four lines. You never have to lift your pencil or crayon or whatever it is from the paper. The lesson from this is be sure you understand the boundaries. When someone gives you a problem, what's part of it? What are the lines? If you always have to color within the lines, that may not give you all of the uh, solutions that you might be able to uh, actually solve the problem or find, this, find the solution. And again, a favorite philosopher, Groucho Marx. I've actually found that this problem is solved, again, more often by younger people because they are less likely to feel that they have to follow the same within the lines constrained solutions. How about a word problem? We'll start off with one here, uh, which I'll read to you. Nancy's parents were a very eccentric physicist and a wacky electrical engineer. We don't have any of those here, right, John? Um, Anyhow, Nancy's parents got married uh, in grad school. So they, they were both in grad school learning things and they had five children. Now, because they were eccentric, but they were very orderly. I mean, physicists and ele electrical engineers tend to like order. So they named their children. The first children was Nana. The second child was Nene. Third child was Nini. Fourth child was Nono. What did they name their fifth child? If any of you said Nunu, no, 
was Nancy. Because Nancy's parents were really, she was the fifth child out of five. Patterns aren't rules. And sometimes the solution is given to you. But because you see the patterns, you assume that the solution or the next in a sequence must follow what came before. It's really important that you don't lose track of what you've already heard and that you don't get into the belief that simply because there's a pattern that everything must match it. Here's another one of those kind of word puzzles. There's a terrible plane crash in the Andes Mountains. That's uh, in South America, by the way. News reports from the scene stated definitively that every single person had died. Tragedy. Authorities verified these reports. A week later, 22 survivors met at a memorial service. How can that be? Every single person died and it, and it was verified. How could they meet? How's it possible? And it's not simply because it was in South America. It's because every single person had died. All the married couples survived. Again, words matter. If there are adjectives or adverbs in place or case or other things in a description, um, in a requirement statement, in a manual entry, they matter. And if you're doing security, you should read these carefully. Make sure you understand what they mean and how they apply. Of course, John von Neumann, great computer scientist, uh, was also a philosopher. But part of what he did, no use being precise about something when you don't even know what you're talking about. Talking about the single people, there no single person, or no, every single person died. That's being precise. It's just being precise in a way that you may be uh, ignoring. Here's a little computer program. And this is written in, well, C, C++. Um, and um, I realize not everybody in the audience is familiar with that language, but it's just a little short section of code. And when I say what, what is wrong, let me just say that there is something wrong with this program. And the question is, what is it? And so I'll let you look at this. I'll give you, I'll give you again, a little bit of time. Give you, an, give you a, a minute to look at it. And some of the old timey programmer or people who've done an awful lot of uh, systems work have uh, spotted this when I've given it, but many, many programmers look at this and don't realize what's wrong with it. So I'll give you another 10 seconds to look at it. <clears throat> Okay. Now, on a 32-bit machine, I give the numbers here. The same would be true for a 64-bit or 128-bit. <clears throat> when you put in numbers that are near the extremes of the capacity of the numbers and add them together, they overflow into a negative number. And so the program will print the sum of two positive integers is always a positive integer, and then it will print a negative integer. The arithmetic that is done on a computer system does not always mirror what happens in the outside world because the values in a computer system, whether they're integral or uh, floating precision, are limited as to what they can represent. They lose precision, they lose values. And so if you're going to write code, you should always check to make sure that you haven't hit those limits. 
named Douglas Adams, uh, not exactly a philosopher, but a great thinker whose works I can recommend highly, uh, observed that in cases of major discrepancy, it's always reality that's got it wrong because reality is frequently inaccurate, which we know all too well. So remember what I started with. Security or software engineering is building systems that do what you want them to do. Safety engineering is building systems that don't do things you don't want them to do. And security engineering is building systems that only do what you want them to do. If you aren't clear what a system should do or what a system might do, then you can't constrain what it should do. Or I should say will do. Uh, that slide, I got it wrong. Um, you can't constrain what it will do. The problem is if you don't really understand, if you don't understand the requirements, if you don't understand the context, if you don't understand the limitations of the programming language or the system you're working with, if you don't understand the eventual goals, no, you can't build it correctly and you're not gonna be able to make it secure. So that brings me to the end of the slides, other than this one, where I wanna say thank you for listening to me. And I will open this up if anybody has any questions or comments that you wanna ask, I'd be happy to respond. All right, folks, if you have anything, please type it in the chat or the Q&A. Yeah, I don't have the chat showing. I just had the Q&A. So please yeah. use that if you, uh, oh, there's the, there's the chat. Wynn says hi. Hey, Wynn. Well, we have some real positive uh, feedback. Um, we have plenty of time if anybody has a thought provoking question. All right, lots of kudos. Uh, good to see you, Spath. Here, I'll, I'll come on. Shad and I are here. Ah. Uh, he's kind of hiding there in the shadows, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, his, his uh, invisibility cloak has got a, a short. It's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, he got it from Boba Fett and it was uh, secondhand, but uh, we did take the Death Star down earlier. So we're really excited about that. Excellent. Um, Excellent. Is, uh, we, we've, we've hit some of our deliverables for this conference. So, yeah, well, you can see I'm giving the talk from my control room and all my minions have taken the afternoon off. Yes, yes, I can see that. Um, I'm going to have to zoom in and see if I can see any passwords on the screens there. But. All right. Well, hey, it's it's great to see you. Say hi to Patty, and uh, I'll I'll end the recording and thank the audience. We're going to be starting up at three thirty central in about nine minutes with our next speaker. Our final speaker is Ira Winkler, uh, talking about you can stop stupid. So that would oh, be a great presentation. It, that would be great. I would love to get him uh, I, to, I wanna, uh, <laughs> to apply that to at least my university administration. There you go. There you go. I'm sure we all have some executives we'd include in that list. So. Yes, there are. Well, I hope everybody enjoys the rest of Corden Con and the weekend. Uh, it's a pleasure as always, uh, John. And uh, uh, thank you all for listening. So. All right. Thanks, Beth. Have a great weekend.